Um, I, I'm delighted to be here. What I'm going to be doing is giving an overview of where I consider ultrasound image analysis to be. And I'm going to be using my, my own work, you'd expect that, to talk through um, some of the changes that have been happening. Um, some of you will be working in other areas of medical image analysis, and hopefully you can connect as well to what I'm um, talking about um, in, in, in terms of your own interests as well. And even the title, I, I did think about this. You can talk about advances in smart ultrasound. I think as technologists, we like to think about technology being smart. But the other version of this talk and the way I talk is because I'm very much interdisciplinary is to think about um, advances in simplifying ultrasound. And I actually sometimes prefer that because what the goal is always is to make this technology just easier to use by the end users. So um, if you take a step back, which, which is where I want to sort of start, is, is just to think about what have been the drivers of change for medical ultrasound over the last decade. You've always had the clinical applications, that's our end users. And more recently, there's been a flurry of interest, particularly looking at lung ultrasound because of COVID, but there are, there are new applications um, coming along all the time. We've also had the advances in physics, improving the image quality, um, and that, again, is a steady pace um, advancement. And the third area is this reduction in size of technology that you can see on this slide going from in 1998, that's the first ultrasound machine bought in my lab, all the way down to the handheld probes today. And that's driven not by advances in, in image analysis, not by advances in, in applications or physics, but through the electronics. But it's that change that's really changing how people view ultrasound. It's changing what are some of the um, questions that you can look at and problems you can try and try and answer. So this is a slide I like to show because um, I think it nicely reflects where ultrasound is today and thinking about the future. Um, that the figure you're showing there comes from a market research report that's looking at handheld ultrasound. Um, what, what you can see there at the bottom it are, are the, the adopters of using handheld ultrasound. And as you can see, that it's going through things like in this current period where, where it's got the early majority, it's about how ultrasound, um, handheld ultrasound is going into primary care. Then you're seeing examples going to, for example, community midwives, etc. And this report was interesting. It was summarizing some of the technologies you're seeing in there. As you can see, a variety of companies now produce these handheld probes. They're low cost. Um, the probe we use is the one for, on this slide called Content Probe. It's $850. Um, and so the technology cost has really come down. And you can also get laptop-based technologies. And so you can really question now, why is ultrasound not used everywhere? And what's picked up in this report and really what's holding everything back is the fact ultrasound still remains a technology that requires lots of expertise to use the probe. And without that problem solved, it's never gonna be going into some of the applications shown here. So what my group's been doing and, and some groups around the world, including some great work um, in TOOM as well, is really how you try and think about how you can simplify ultrasound so that both experts find it easier to use the technology, as well as people who don't normally use ultrasound can start to pick up a pro and use it for clinical decision-making. And one way to view what the, where we are now is what we're trying to do, if you, if you see in this figure, if you think about people's skill level in using an, ultra, um, an ultrasound pro, and then you look at the performance that, that they have in performing a task, what you're finding today is very much, if you measure things in the field, um, there'll be a quite, there'll be people who, who are highly trained, but their performance at the task is very varied. And what we really want to do through the image analysis is make everybody cluster more closely together so that they can perform a task very well every single time. So that's become one of the tasks and one of the challenges of the field. And then the other one is to address the area where you'd, you'd say people are less skilled, they're not um, fully trained sonographers, the people doing the scanning, there are other clinical professionals who will be occasional users of the technology. You also want to be able to 
um, serve their needs. And that can also require thinking about designing solutions in a, in a different way um, that, than we do today. And what I'm gonna to be touching on are some um, areas in which we're working in this space. So the way I describe how things have evolved in ultrasound image analysis, so let's just focus on the analysis, is that we've had these generations. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, 20 years back or so, um, there we very much talked about model-based ultrasound image analysis, model-based image analysis. Um, one of the, the first paper, in fact, that I published in this space is shown here. It was in Medical Image Analysis Journal, which again is a very familiar journal. This was back in 1999, um, volume three, so one of the early issues. This is now the, um, what, one of the big journals in the field. And what's interesting is in the space of that 20 years or so, how things have changed for all of us. So if you now take this paper published in the top journal and you look at the data that was used, it was acquired using an HB Sonus 100 ultrasound machine. The data was recorded on video and then digitized. So there was no digital data available. And to get the paper published, data from one healthy, one normal patient and one abnormal patient was used throughout. And I highlight this because it also reflects how things have changed. You, know, you, you now have hundreds or thousands of subjects that you would use to build models. And in, it is a relatively short period of time that we've managed to change. And at this stage though, image analysis was largely remained this sort of academic curiosity. It's like, could you um, actually um, automate this task? And little work was translated um, through to commercial systems. So things have moved on, and really the era that you could say we're in now is what I call Generation 1. And this has been around now about 10 years because deep learning has been around that, that period. And it's very much based on the classic deep learning imaging paradigm. And here the focus has been focusing on task automation. And what we know is if you use deep learning, that means we need lots of data. So the standard paradigm, which most of you will be familiar with, is you start by identifying clinical need. In this case, the particular problem we were looking at was how can you find a plane in a fetal heart? And what you're seeing here is the circle that's located on the fetal heart. Um, and then the color is telling you the plane, the slice, the virtual slice through the heart. And you're also seeing the phase of the cardiac cycle. So you'd set the task as, can you develop um, a, a, a um, overlay that would allow you to do that? You'd then acquire your clinical real world data. You would then focus on the machine learning architecture to be able to solve that problem. And as we know, there's been um, many, many uh, approaches to how you would design machine learning algorithms. And in the area I work in, primarily obstetrics ultrasound, this has led to some real success stories particularly looking at the down, two downstream tasks focused on the second trimester, which is the midpoint of pregnancy, looking at how you can automate fetal biometry. And you can see some examples here of um, methods that have been developed um, over, the, over the last um, decade or so, where you are having acquired an image, you can um, fit ellipses and lines, and you can measure geometry, and from that, be able to estimate gestational age. I would argue now that that particular task is essentially solved. It appears in most commercial machines um, and you get some really good results. And that can definitely be, be considered a deep learning success story. Another success story is in the area of automated standard plane detection. Um, and automated standard plane detection is trying to look at the process of capturing a um, standard plane, that means the plane on which you would measure biometry. And there, if you look at what, when I presented this earlier, this addresses, both of these address this issue of how through image analysis, you can get a human now with assistance of these tools can be able to always perform a task at a high level. And again, I've shown here some examples of some of the literature with the times on them to give you an idea how relatively quickly through, um, through using deep learning and through tran translation of solutions, you can go all the way through to now seeing some of the solutions on, um, on, in products. 
And I've just made a note here. I think this is a, a point to discuss with a, maybe a subset of us. Um, there is some confusion a little bit about the definition of standard plane detection, but I'm going to leave that aside now. But if we think about the process of being able to move a probe and know when you acquired an image that you can you perform biometry, then um, that, that, that problem has essentially been solved. Um, this is just showing again some early work. This is actually using random forests in this case, but it's a really early, early example of being able to um, go through the process of doing image recognition, um, recognizing the types of, of plane you've got, um, and having done that, you can then um, identify, having, for example, identified a head, you can then fit the ellipse. But just to highlight then how, how far things have gone, here, here's an example that's come through some of the work that my spin out um, companies developed. And they developed this um, system called ScanLab, which is shown here as that second screen. It was, this was one of their pilot studies. And what you're seeing here is as, as the sonographer's scanning, you see on the, the side screen, you see some color, um, some, some little boxes that are either colored or not. And what they're highlighting, if they go green, is that you've identified that particular structure within the image. And for it to be a standard plane, you need to have identified enough of these structures need to be visible in that plane to be able to say that you're at the correct orientation. What happens in, in this case, you're just seeing a heart come through the view here. It will capture in a minute that she's moving the pro until she gets enough of the marks of being green. I might actually play, play that again, just to, to illustrate. And when you've either got all the, all the labels green or you've tried hard enough that you want to accept it, um, you would press the button if you were overriding the automated system. If, if they've all gone green, it automatically pops up into the screen um, and it's providing the automated checklist. You can see them going around the side. As you move, it will place the um, standard play result in these particular boxes. So it's become a, it's a bit like having now a peer looking over your shoulder, telling you that you've captured a good enough image for the diagnostic purpose. This type of solution now has been well validated. It's gone through um, approvals and it's now appears on GE's um, Volusun Swift system. So it's, it's, real, it's a real example, uh, of course, behind the scenes, many, many hours of, of um, algorithm development, of data gathering um, and validation has gone now into being able to support um, sonographers in their workflow and also from auditing purposes. So, so that's sort of just briefly looking at some examples of how over the last decade, certainly deep learning has not just led to lots of academic publications, but in the case of obstetrics ultrasound, it's also starting to, um, to see the benefit um, in clinical practice. So if we now go back to the slide I had on looking at generation one, um, there, of course, there's a limitation that we're all, all familiar with, is that deep learning works well when you've got lots of data. And just as in other areas, in ultrasound, image analysis has now moved to ultrasound video analysis. And there, um, with people are looking at things, for example, to, again, in the algorithm space, looking at self-supervision. So for example, if you work with video, you can use the temporal continuity as a self-supervision um, signal to be able to build representations of, um, that, that can be used as the basis of um, solving tasks. And also people are starting to look at video explainability as well to um, explain whether, whether an algorithm has um, built a good representation. But perhaps the, the more interesting change is, is moving away from thinking about algorithms to now think about more the data and the importance of really um, designing uh, acquisition protocols, thinking about how if you've got small data sets rather than large data sets, 
you can use data augmentation techniques and the influence those have on building models of problems and particularly building models of problems that are um, that that would be impossible to build if you had to wait a long time to be able to get um, a traditional deep learning um, model um, and the size of data that might require. And also, people are also thinking about domain shifts. And there, I'm going to highlight an example later where now there is a wide variety of high end ultrasound data. We're interested in how we can use that with some of the low cost ultrasound data, where there's a, just a small amount of data. How can we build models that can support um, developing models that are suitable for the low cost ultrasound probes? And that, that requires getting a handle on what are the important aspects of domain shift. So this shift towards understanding the role of data rather than the algorithm, which is another way to view that is we're relaxing this assumption that there is a data lake available. I personally think is one of the import, most important shifts in medical image analysis um, thinking. It moves us away from being applied computer vision to really think about what are the important issues that are relevant to our particular space of medical imaging. And I think now we're starting to move, as, as we have, um, I, I think before, as you start to move away from computer vision, we start to develop some of our own ways of being able to model problems that are more specific to the needs of healthcare data. So now I'm going to move on to generation two. You'd expect me to have a generation two if I had a generation one. So here's what I call generation two. Other people might have different definitions. Um, but for me, there's a, another sort of area that we've been working in, which, which is, I, I think is quite exciting, is to look at how we can um, combine ultrasound video with other information. Um, in our case, we we, it, it's shown on this slide, we, we record how a probe moves, we record where the person scanning looks on the screen, and we ask them to speak aloud. So we now have, have information that's recorded on the person scanning, rather than the output of their scanning alone, which would be the ultrasound video. And this opens the possibility then to, as I'll, I'll show you, to do two things. One is to learn more about why is scanning hard, which is really quite important to understand how to fix it. And the second one is to see how we can use multimodal data to overcome some of the limitations um, and to add prior knowledge that isn't available if you build models purely on ultrasound video. So this, this then becomes your generation two paradigm which is we've got the information we had before, we've got the ultrasound video, we might have some of the same problems, we might have different ones, but we're now bringing in this knowledge of sonographer, we're bringing in the human intelligence in, into how we build models. And so what you, you might hope is these models are richer, we can take, um, they're more representative of the real world because we're capturing the context of acquisition, not just the acquisition itself, and they might be more efficient, meaning that we might be able to get away with having less data. Some of those points I've just made there are probably still to be demonstrated, but that's the, um, the motivation. So this has come, the work we've been doing is under an ERC project that I've been working on for about five years now. Um, again, set in the context of obstetrics ultrasound scanning, where we are scanning in the clinic in Oxford, first, second and third trimester, those are the three points in pregnancy you scan. Um, we have over a thousand scans and what we capture in this room is, as I've already mentioned, the diagnostic scan, which is what you traditionally have. We have an eye tracker, which allows you to capture sonographer gaze. We have an IMU to look at probe motion and we have a microphone that records the sonographer speech. And I call this perception ultrasound because what we're trying to do is get as much information measured on the person scanning that I could think of that we can then use to combine with their output, which is the ultrasound video. And then the, this allows you to look at many questions and I haven't got time to go in, into detail in, in, in all, all of the things we've been looking at um, today, um, 
there are there are some papers that we've published that you're welcome to to look at but they're broadly in these two areas one is to understand clinical sonography because we're measuring it for the first time in this way um, and so it's interesting to see what measuring in the real world what is, what you can learn about scanning um, from that you can put numbers to it and then also we can use this data to be able to build some AI assistive technology. So that's some of the tools that could help with, uh, potentially help with new users. If we've gathered this information on experts, can we develop assistive technologies that allow new users to feel more comfortable in using ultrasound? And we can look at issues of workflow efficiency, standardization, et cetera. And it's of course using a multimodal um, modeling approach. And it's very, low, it's very low cost overhead. All these extra sensors are very cheap. And it's also doesn't change the behavior of the sonographer um, because we aren't actually putting any instrumentation on them as well. So we're trying to capture real world. So what, what can we learn from that? Well, first of all, we can do some sonography um, data science. And um, particularly what our clinical collaborators have been looking at is to look at some of these questions about why is clinical sonography hard to master? There are many, many training programs that tried over many years, um, having some overlays, people still find it difficult. So can we have some further insight into what aspects are difficult? Of course, if you've acquired lots of this data and you can automate, automatically annotate it, you can look at simple things like what when you do a scan how much time do you spend on different elements might not seem very exciting on the surface but even just realizing that the amount of time spent on the abdomen and brain is only 50 percent of the time if we think from an image analysis point of view we spend all our time trying to automate that it really puts in question is that where we should place the emphasis and if our goal is to improve workflow we've looked at um, some more academic questions like, can eye tracking data alone classify the type of anatomy plane? Um, so where people look and the gaze patterns, do they tell you alone what you're looking at? So that's a, a little bit academic. Um, and then we've compared, for example, where people actually look when they scan to look, if they look at the same standard plane, so they're looking at the same anatomy, in the third and sorry, the second and the third trimesters, do they look in different places? Um, and there, what was quite interesting, um, or was at least reinforcing, is they're trained to look for, for certain structures in the um, third trimester. You'll actually see them looking for them, even though they're not present, um, was one of our findings. And to compensate the fact that the quality of ultrasound deteriorates naturally with time, with gestational age. They, they, they look for other structures. They make more reference to what the midline of the head, for example, to, to reassure themselves that, 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 they, that they are checking the anatomy. So just using the type of um, in the, the multimodal data we've got um, has provided our clinicians with some interesting insights into scanning. And the last example on here was um, a, a, a little paper we published more recently that was using the eye tracker um, outputs pupil diameter changes and you can translate that into something called the task evoked capillary response and there we wanted to see if we could pick up any differences when you were for example looking at a heart or you were looking at a brain and you end up with these characteristic differences to do the changes in the pupil diameter that is a measure of the how hard someone is finding a task and although we haven't found an application of this um, perhaps in future, this will be a way to, um, for us to assess how well technology has simplified things if we find that some of these types of patterns change if we're lo looking at things um, over large scales. Workflow analysis is also possible. Um, we recently published um, a full um, analysis pipeline, which goes all the way from taking scans, full out, full automated annotation of what anatomy you're looking at when. And having done that, you can look at the order in which you look at anatomies. And having done that, you can look at things like, do all sonographers look at the anatomies in the same order? Under what circumstances do they not? How long do they spend looking at certain structures? Do experts 
um, spend um, less time looking at structures than, um, than people trainees. And we've set up this sort of analysis pipeline to be able to do that. In terms of answering the questions that I've mentioned, we haven't um, got solid answers because our numbers are still relatively small, but we certainly have the tools now to be able to look at it as if we can really try and get a much bigger, better handle on how people are, are scanning and whether there can be some minor changes made in the way people are trained that might um, help um, improve um, and also retain knowledge when you're learning to scan. The other aspect that we've been looking at is um, thinking about how we can combine the imaging modalities that we've got. So video and X, where X is gaze, audio or probe information, or even think about how they might go together and what types of model you can build from that. And hence what assistive tools you might be able to um, introduce. So, so I'm going to look, look briefly at the three examples shown on this slide. We've got video gaze models. What those aim to do is to try and look at the question, can a computer predict where a sonographer should look? So if we've got training data from experts and you can then present the overlay that suggests where some, someone looks, is this of, of use to, um, to someone who's not an expert? Or we are, Image audio models allow you to describe what's seen in an ultrasound image, um, so generate a text-based description. That means you no longer need to be able to read ultrasound images, which I think many people would find useful. And then video probe models, um, those um, are interested in, in the question, can a computer predict where a sonographer should move the probe next? And that is a very important um, area that um, the field is looking at the moment, which relates to um, how you can guide someone while they're scanning an ultrasound. So let me give you some brief results um, and examples from our work looking at this. Um, this is basically the data you have as input if you take video and if you've got the gaze, that little green dot that you see is where someone's looking. And so it's essentially, it's, it's an annotation, but it's an annotation that's come from the person doing the task. So it's a very rich cue to be able to know where to look. And even if you've not really looked at ultrasound images before, where maybe you should focus your attention and also hence where the computer should focus attention. So what we've, we've, we've been looking at, um, we've published, um, three models now be able to do this are ways that use this type of data to build prediction models. And then given an ultrasound video stream, you'll then be predicting where the gaze point would be. And that, that's a form of saliency prediction. Um, so this, this was one of that earlier works um, on this area, which was using sort of a GANS-based approach, which posed the problem as a multitask where the primary task was, it was, if you were given a frame, was to classify that frame as being um, an abdomen frame or not. And then the auxiliary task, which is really the one we were interested in, was to predict the sonographer visual attention to assist the primary task, so predict where someone would look. And if you look at the example shown here, this example is the standard AC, that's ab abdominal circumference plane is shown at the top. To example, you can see in the first color, the ground truth, and then the best algorithm here is shown as this BCE plus GAN in this, this line. And then the background ones you expect to be more, more random as well. And you can sort of see it's doing a pretty good job, certainly compared with some of the other methods. Another model we developed is shown here. Um, and here what you've got is the green is the ground truth, which is why it flips between the two spots because you're only looking at one point at any one time. And what you're seeing here, highlighted here as these saliency points are the two areas where the algorithm um, is saying that you should look or that the gaze point should be present. And you can see it, it worked pretty well. And what we've, we've just started a, a project um, 
of a few weeks ago now, where we're going to be looking at how this type of solution, um, whether it can actually be used um, to guide someone or what role it might have as um, assistance to, as people get close to finding the plane, do you switch something, an overlay of this kind on? Does it help you um, navigate to be able to um, find the, the, the final plane? And we'll hopefully be able to report on that um, later in the year. So that's an example of, of you doing image and gaze, video and gaze. Um, this is quite a busy slide, um, it's just summarising the work which is audiovisual, and I'll just talk over it briefly. Um, this was the work of um, Mohammed Al Sharid, who's um, recently um, graduated, um, and it, his, his whole PhD has been looking at this space. Um, and it's looking at how, if you were given an image, um, how, how you could generate that text-based description. It's not trying to, set, to um, generate a um, diagnostic report. It's just trying to describe um, the image with a valid sentence. That's, that's what he was looking at, because what we, we asked the sonographers was to talk about what they were doing and what they, what they were looking at during the scan. So, so in his thesis, he's actually looked at a variety of methods. He's, um, the general idea is that you would be taking a, a pair, such as shown here, an image, and then that image, the image caption pair, the text that goes with it. Um, here says we can see the midline of the brain where we can see the cavum septum pellucidum. Um, and you have lots of examples of that kind of real, real um, captions and images. Um, and then he's, look, he's investigated different ways that would now given an image would generate the caption. And we've just got, I've just got some examples shown on the second half of some of his latest um, work, which was using LSTM's R RNNs to be able to generate the textual description. Um, and you can see GT is the ground truth. You can see the type of description. This is the left ventricle outflow track. And one of the methods towards the bottom would be one of the um, better methods. This is the left ventricle outflow tract. Um, it's got sort of the perfect answer. Um, what you find though, is at the moment, the type of descriptions that we're generating are very much saying what's in the image. Generalizing now to be able to describe what's going on with video is considerably harder. And that's something that we're going to start to do. But the real purpose of this was just, if, if you were trying to describe perhaps to a technician or someone doing um, an ultrasound scan to give them confidence as they were learning to scan. Would, can you, are you able to just generate very simple descriptors that could communicate some of the content that's um, present in an ultrasound image? The third example is probe motion and video. Um, probe motion, you can see the example here. Um, just visualize as you move the probe, you can see the effect it has on the appearance of the ultrasound image and you've got the gaze point as well. And all the work I've, I've talked about earlier has been very much focusing on what you're seeing in the blue box here, which is really to do with ultrasound interpretation. It's thinking more about quantification and detection. If you move, if you move um, upstream, you've got to start to move the probe. You're thinking about how do I get to the point I've got something that's interesting to talk about um, or measure, for example. And you can divide, in ultrasound, you can divide that into two steps. You have, you have the adjust and refine, which is sort of what you're seeing here, where you're just moving the probe around a small amount, and that's essentially dominated by rotations. Or you'd have a more general search, which would maybe be going between anatomies. And that's sort of a, a longer distance. That, that is really hard to model, whereas the adjust and refine probe position is, it, is that sort of um, capability that would support someone finding a, a good plane. And it's that that we're interested in. And we've been looking at this in two ways. Um, there's a video running now. This is the, um, in fact, I might stop it. Um, 
The first approach is, is, is much more sort of a robotic approach, which says, can a computer predict where a sonographer should move the probe next? And if you want to do that, one approach to, the, to do this would be to take examples where you've got, um, you, you've got probe movement, you've got the ultrasound video, and then you could learn a local feature description, um, ideally in this a self-supervised way, so you don't depend on annotations, um, that would allow you to describe that fine tuning action. And then on top of that, you would then, oh, after that stage, you can then form some um, regression that would allow you to estimate rotation between the frames. Um, and this is one approach that um, we've been looking at, if it will. Well, let me, I might have to go back one to go forward. My screen might have, there we go. Um, this is the approach. So the feature encoder part, the local descriptor part describes the match. And then having, that is really the difficult part is figuring out as shown here, what is a dense match between the two frames. And what, what you're seeing here is the match point, very, very densely mapped between the two frames and the color is showing the strength of the match. So you end up with this dense map. And from that, you take the match points from that you can then recover the rotation. So it looks quite noisy, um, but through the density of the matches, you can then recover a rotation through the consistency of matches across, across the examples. And what, what's shown here is that are just some examples for different types of um, rotations that you might want to estimate. So that's, that's an approach that's been developed and you can sort of see if you are now predicting the, the rotation, this is showing you the, um, uh, the error. If you were moving 50 frames, 100, 150, 250, this is the number of degrees of error. So it's quite a small number of degrees error. So it, it's actually working um, very well, but it's all for relatively small movements, which is what you would see typical in this adjustment phase. The other approach that um, Henry, who's been working in this area, um, has developed is, is very different. He, he, he's come from a robotics background. He, was, he developed the method I've, I've just shown you, which estimates a rotation. But humans then don't know how to move a very, very small rotation. That's very much what you get a robot to do. So from a human, from their perspective, they would, they're more likely to find a, a functionality useful if they could understand um, where they are in a 3D space. So what he then developed was a visual or an image guided assistance based technique in, instead. And this is based on the on using landmark retrieval. And um, the basic idea here is that if you've got a 3D model of the object that you're looking at, in this case, it would be looking at the fetus. What we do then is you, and you've got lots of mapping between a 3D model and what an ultrasound image would look like if it had been captured um, on that object. You then learn that relationship between 3D space and the ultrasound image. Then as you scan, when you capture an ultrasound image, you can then map that into the 3D world and you can show someone where they are on the 3D model. So we would call that, that is actually a landmark, a landmark retrieval problem. And he developed a solution to be able to do that. Um, how he did this was he used an ultrasound simulator for which the fetus was static. That was one of the big advantages, acquired lots and lots of data where you knew the true 3D position and you could, you could um, identify data pairs of image and 3D location. You could then learn the relationship between those. So when you were, had a query ultrasound image, you could then recover the corresponding 3D position in space. That, that's in essence what the words say there and the basic idea. And you can see some examples here where um, if, if, you, if, if you were, the query image was the one he presented, and then the one that you would recover on the 3D model that was closest 
which would give you the 3D location is shown in the bottom. And the reason to display the results this way is that you can see how then how far off you were in a 3D, in, in capturing the, the 3D position, but through the eyes of taking an ultrasound scan. So what you want is the, these two to look quite similar and not be as if they're sliced slightly different in 3D space. If, if you look at these examples, they're all um, pretty good. Um, and, and so those are quite encouraging results. Um, and we're hoping to be able to now take that work forward. Um, clearly at the moment, it's based on simulated data um, and how you extend it to the real world um, would, will require some more work to be able to capture the, the difference between um, you know, a real fetus and the fact that in, in this case, it wasn't moving. So the, in the last part of the talk, what I wanted to just um, spend a, a little bit of time on now is thinking about ultrasound and community care, because everything I've talked about at the moment is very much trying to help people who are up in this space here, who, who are trained, who work in a very skilled environment, and you want them to all work um, to high performance. But what about the people who are the occasional users, the people who pick up a probe, handheld probe occasionally, and they also want to be able to always use, use the ultrasound probe to the best um, of the ability to make a good um, clinical decision. And here, this, this takes me briefly to look at some of the work that we've been doing um, aimed at low and middle income countries. Um, why it's so important that, that we, and, um, and I'm interested in this space, is the World Health Organization says that over 60% of the world's population has no access to ultrasound imaging for medical diagnosis. And the, real, the reasons for that is not necessarily, though it says here equipment cost, it is equipment cost, it's the high skill required to scan. Um, particularly if you want people to scan, how people do scan if they're in a, in, in a high income country setting. People have tried to introduce education training programs. Some have been great successes, others less so. And because of this mixed miss success, the notion that you can solve all problems by training um, really hasn't been shown to be true. So what we're interested in is where are the opportunities for medical image analysis? If you combine medical image analysis with low cost ultrasound probes, how can they contribute to um, lowering this um, statistic? And the approach we've been taking is to work with groups on introducing very simplified scanning protocols. So don't sort of copy high income settings and just wheel in machines. Think about what are the decisions you can make with simplified scanning protocols and using automated image, image interpretation models. So that's deep learning models. And of course, we've got all the challenges of working, building models in this space. You've got small data, you're going to have a variable appearance in your image. And of course, if you're, we're talking about translation, technology needs to, need, needs to be trustworthy, often with different end users than you would meet if you're in a high income setting. So we've got two programs of, of, of research. One of them is um, in the UK, there's been some funding called Global Challenge Research Funding that's allowed us to work with overseas partners and fund work overseas. We've had a project um, and what we've, we have an ongoing project with a group in India looking, um, looking at um, ultrasound video algorithms for pregnancy risk assessment. Um, I don't have time to go into this. We're also starting to publish some of this work, but the the basic idea is to use these very simple protocols where you, you, you cross the abdomen in certain um, straight line patterns. Um, you can easily train people to um, do this and then build risk stratification algorithms on top of, on top of that. For example, breach detection is, is, a, is an example um, and also um, look, looking at placenta location as well, which is important to delivery. So we have an ongoing effort in that space. The other example is called Tracer, and I was going to briefly talk about this. Um, Tracer um, is a little device we've developed. It uses the content probe, which is shown here on a notebook, 
it's being used in um, Kenya um, and the Gambia, and that where they're evaluating how you can use this within a clinical trial setting for um, estimating gestational age. And really the, the, what we're driving here, to, here is to develop the technology to, to the point that it could be translated into um, clinical practice, really aiming to try and ensure in the end that every pregnancy around the world will receive an ultrasound-based um, dating, which isn't true today. So gestational age estimation um, is really important um, clinically. It's, you need to know the gestational age to, if a mother presents in pregnancy, you, there's no screening programs in the environments we're talking about. You've never met the woman before. You don't have a clinical record. You want to be able to deliver pregnancy care. You want to be able to look at fetal growth monitoring, and you want to be able to check that the, that the mother is healthy and that the fetus is also growing. And without pregnancy screening programs, which is what we have in high income settings, um, most women just turn up to the clinic when they feel un unwell. So you need to be able to, unlike high income settings, you need to be able to estimate gestational age um, at any point in pregnancy. And that's, that's the big difference than the fetal biometry that I've shown you before. And the challenge becomes, the ultrasound images really vary in appearance across the whole of pregnancy. So we've, what we've done is we've been part of a, a fantastic consortium um, that's called Precise, that's been doing a clinical study. And we're, we're a little innovation wing where we've um, been gathering data for them, allowing them to um, have gestational age estimates for all the women coming in their study. And while we've been gathering the data with our low cost probe, we've now built um, some uh, the algorithms that allow us to, to have automate to, to automated how you can estimate gestational age um, and have this little, little device that's shown here. From a medical image analysis point of view, behind the scenes are two algorithms. Um, one of them checks video quality. Um, there we've had to build a solution that's used few shot few shot learning because we've had a small number of examples in a supervised way we've gone through and we've assessed quality of the video and taken the high quality video, which is a small number, to then um, come up with an algorithm which will tell the user whether the video they've captured is an eight second video, whether that video is fit for purpose or they need to retake it. So it's very, very simple to give an instruction, very cheap to retake. We ask them then to acquire three high quality videos using this quality video tool. And then having done that, um, what we've published recently is a method of doing, um, measuring the transcerebellar diameter and the head circumference, which are the two measures that um, can be used. If you measure either of those, there's a lookup table that allows you to estimate gestational age and particularly TCD, the transcerebellar diameter, is known to be um, a better single measure to measure if you're estimating gestational age across the whole of pregnancy. So we've developed a method that um, estimates these in the very low quality images, which is a sort of quite unusual method where it's, it's using the soup, the soup, it's an unsupervised um, method that uses a combination of um, the um, high end ultrasound machine data combined with low ultrasound data to be able to estimate um, these, the line or the um, ellipse required. And the sort of the errors we're getting compared with ground truth is of the order of 2.5 and four millimeters and 1.6 millimeters, which are quite small. Um, and so it's quite encouraging results but purely based on a low cost solution. I'll skip over that one. Um, so just as a final point, I've talked a lot about and given you a high level overview about the image analysis, talked about some of the types of solution we're starting to translate. But this particular project really high, highlights as soon as you do that and you want to translate and you work with multi-sites around the world, you move far away from the image analysis and you get very much into thinking about um, other aspects of translational research. When you're working with 
groups from other countries. You have to think about some very practical issues, who owns the data, who owns the AI, the intellectual property. We have to be really careful about um, respecting local data governance rules when we capture data. We have to also think about local regulations needed to satisfy if we were going to be then evaluating a device in these settings. Um, you've also, when you work in areas where they do not do um, a lot of research, how standard those evaluation environments and clinics, how representative of use in the real world. We've also had big discussions in, um, about cultural views towards using ultrasound in pregnancy. Um, and you have to respect whether um, those, as, as well as you, people have views on whether they want to be scanned by anything that has the word artificial intelligence in it as well. So all these very non-technical issues start to become important and you have to consider them as you're part of an interdisciplinary team taking your technology forward to um, translation. And of course, there's always the questions like, will a device built in data from Oxford, work in Kenya or Mozambique or the Gambia, which again, you, at every single point, you have to think about how you're going to um, think about these questions, what biases might be introduced. So although there's lots of questions, personally, I find these very interesting. Um, I think it's part of the research we do. If we, if we first publish the first method, uh, we have Mikai conference, for example, um, if you want to see it being used and taken through, you have to think about all these issues. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, we've had some um, very good conversations and collaborations built around it. So just to summarize then, I think it's re a really exciting era for ultrasound. Um, it's, it's being enabled by low cost probes, large scale data capture and deep learning. Um, the, multimodal, the multimodal fetal ultrasound is a sort of quite intriguing um, variant of how we might do um, ultrasound analysis. It allows you to understand clinical sonography, for example, and there's also this opportunity to build assistive technologies. And then quite in a quite different way, low and middle income settings offer real new opportunities for this simplified ultrasound. Um, we've been working on ultrasound based gestational estimation, pregnancy risk stratification, but there are many other areas as well where you don't just go in, acquire data, automate as you would in, in high income settings. You really need to think what, what's different about this environment and what would be the appropriate solution that would work and be accepted and make a difference as well in low and middle income settings. And the, maybe the most important thing is that ultrasound image analysis is no longer, it's just about the algorithm. You know, it started out originally, that's what we did. It's now, as I've been talking about, there are many other um, aspects. And it's very much to have this interdisciplinary thinking um, from day one, study design. All we talk about now is study design, study design. You know, are we capturing the data that reflects the problem? Um, and thinking about you know, algorithm choice, clinical meaningful metrics, and also things like biases in our data. So that's given you this whirlwind view of what we do. I hope you found some of it interesting. Um, thank you for your attention. And if you really are interested in this area, we recently formed this special interest group as in Nikai Medical Ultrasound One. You're very welcome to join us and hopefully we can all work together on taking um, ultrasound forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison, for this really fascinating.